Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery. I'm here today with Matt Nettleton. He lives in Australia, as you'll be able to tell from his accent. And he works with trauma. He also has a, a personal history with drugs that we'll talk about a little bit as well. And he is a Killaby Inquiries certified facilitator, a senior facilitator of that method of Scott Killaby's. And uh, let's just jump right in, Matt. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to here? Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a long story. I'll keep it as, as short as possible. But um, <clears throat> so I had spent many, many years in, in addiction. My main drug of choice was heroin, uh, along with prescription medications and benzos like Xanax and um, Hypnodorm, I think previously known as Rohypnol and Valium and all of those sort of nasty drugs. Um, <clears throat> and so if I just quickly explain how I came into having an addiction and I think it'll help give some perspective around my perspective on addiction and it's also Scott's and a lot of other people's mm -hmm. um, as I was growing up you know I think I was actually born with like an inherent feeling of, of not belonging you know whether it was due to you know my dad being highly traumatized and I inherited that trauma like generational mm -hmm. trauma and all of that stuff but um, you know, ever since I, I, as long as I can remember, you know, I always had this feeling in me that something's wrong. Oh, okay. It was like an undercurrent of, of impending doom. You know, it was quite subtle, you know, mm -hmm. to with, but it was always there, you know, like a, a deep feeling of, of unworthiness of, you know, I don't belong here and, you know, something's wrong and there's something wrong with me. You know? Like it just uh -huh. screwed up when it made me. Mm hmm and that, I think the, the more people I work with and the more people I, I observe, you know, I think it's, it's like a, it's a collective thing. You know, I think, you it know, is. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it was specific to me, you know, which is why maybe I was born with it. I was born into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this sort of, um, I think Thomas Hubel calls it like the collective trauma soup, you know, that we're, mm -hmm. that we're and, um, and so many for so many of us that was our experience as children that we felt out of place, that we felt like there was something wrong with this, unlovable, unworthy. I mean, those are such common core deficiency beliefs that are still operating in most adults. It, yes, very much so. And they like they're, they're the driver of all the dysfunction in the world. Um, I'll, I'll read something out soon that I wrote yesterday, um, but I'll, I'll continue with this first. But it's based on that. Um, mm -hmm. And actually being you know the condition of humanity it's really got nothing to do with with substance abuse i just think that's like a right. um, yeah yeah so <clears throat> like when i went to school i was already carrying that within me you know and i was always really quite sensitive um so maybe i was very very aware it was there and it was very entrenched in my belief system already by the time i started school and mm -hmm. from there, I started getting bullied a whole lot, mm -hmm. um, which actually solidified those beliefs. Yep, there's something wrong with me. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't deserve friends. I don't deserve happiness. You know, um, again, existence screwed up when it made me. And mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> like I always felt really alone um, during my school years. I, I didn't really have any friends. Like people would be my friends, but then they'd turn on me and it was just, like added to that feeling of, of unsafety. You know, so from a very young age, my nervous system was like, what's going to happen? Right. Yeah. Um, which, which is trauma. You know? um, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. what it is. And it's funny because like I used to walk into a room as long as I can remember as well. And, and if my dad was there and he, if he didn't know I was there and I'd say, dad, he'd jump and hit the room. Oh. So he was highly traumatized due to actually um, being held up by heroin addicts because he was a pharmacist and worked night shift. Oh. Yeah. So interesting that I ended up on, on heroin mm. and it challenged all his beliefs about mm. heroin addicts. But um, so I always had that, you know, I grew up in that, in that soup and my experiences were sort of adding to that, to that trauma. And um, when I was 12, um, <clears throat> I remember I, I, smoked weed for the first time marijuana and um it was all overridden <laughs> like yeah, yeah. my whole system went back to oh you know, I didn't feel like there was anything wrong with me I felt safe 
you know, like the whole nervous system just calmed down, my mind calmed down and it was like relief, you know, and um, mm-hmm. right. relief from everything I'd been carrying, you know, because that was my normal. I'd never actually experienced anything but a traumatised state. Yeah. I, yeah. I probably, you know, I'd had moments of, of being happy as a kid and playing around and all of that sort of stuff, but it was always there undercurrent in the background. But your overall experience was of yeah, a really just, dark nervous system hypervigilance. Yeah. Very much so. Okay. And, um, you know, so when, yeah, when I, when I smoked pot for the first time, it was like everything came back to calm and safe. So, of course, I did it again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And but well, that makes sense, right? Yeah, it does, you know, and it's understandable, com- completely understandable. Yeah. Um, and you know, but because I, I'd been bullied as well, you know, um, pretty pretty severely, you know, um, all through primary school. When I hit high school, I made a decision, sort of unconsciously, that you know, I'm not going to be bullied anymore. I'm going to become the tough guy. So I made friends with the people that were you know, already going in and out of juvie and. Um, you know, were a couple of years older than me, um, we, you know, using drugs at school and all of that sort of stuff. So I um, unconsciously sort of made friends with them because I felt safe around them. Right. When I was around mm-hmm. them, my nervous system got that same, it relaxed because hmm. I felt safe. No one would harm me if I'm right. them. Right, if you're with that group, yeah. Yeah. And I feel that happens to a lot of people as well. Like looking back, you know, so many people who were involved in the things I was involved in um, were doing the same thing, covering right. up that that deep sense of, of unsafety or unworthiness or of lack or of deficiency, yeah, whatever it is. But um, so from there, I just sort of it just snowballed. You know, it got out of control quite quickly. You know, I was using methamphetamine. Um, all sorts of like I tried everything by about age fourteen except heroin, and then and it wasn't long after that. Was, I can't remember exactly. It was maybe sixteen, seventeen. I started using heroin intravenously, um, because everything else stopped working. It was sort of like the drugs would give me that relief, certain drugs, oh. but then I would be left with that same anxiety. Sometimes they would make it worse after all. Mm-hmm. So I'd be left mm-hmm. with that same anxiety and then move on to the next drug. But then when I found heroin, it was sort of like, I used to call it a hug from mum. Mm-hmm. It just gave me that complete comfort. But then my tolerance started getting big on that. And um, so I started mixing benzos with it, mainly Xanax um, and mm-hmm. alcohol at the same time. And I'd be smoking pot on top of it. It was sort of like a, I'd be flooding my body with this cocktail. Of, of drugs um and by that point my favorite place to be was between unconscious and dead um, and if i wasn't there i was extremely uncomfortable right? extremely uncomfortable oh, okay. and um like a terrible place to be and you know yeah and, that's a really extreme state yeah it is yeah and the, like looking back you know everyone thought the drugs were the problem and my parents thought like if you just stop using drugs and you know right. the, the psychologists and everyone thinks drugs the problem mm-hmm. but, but they weren't you know because if i didn't have drugs in my system then it, I, I used to say to mom it feels like i've walked into a room and found my whole family you know slaughtered like that fight flight freeze just terror overwhelming my system you know unless i, I had immense amounts of tranquilizers and painkillers within my system right. Right. and um so that was the problem <laughs> you know mm. it's obvious now that that was the problem but um so i was always seeking relief you know i was always seeking to escape myself i never um knew how to how to be with with feelings in the mm-hmm. body i never developed a sense of self-compassion and this is where it comes down to like um cultural sort of collective conditioning. Like I'll just read something that I wrote yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, so one second. So I called it addiction, the dark, sorry, ad- addiction, the dark carousel of humanity. So after a talk I gave today, my final one for the year, I've been reflecting on the current urgency for all of humanity to have a paradigm shift. 
My talk was specifically to people suffering from substance abuse and the topic was trauma and addiction. The more I spoke, the more I drew on the conclusion that this is not an issue specific to people who use drugs and alcohol. It's a condition all of humanity suffers from. So from the very moment we wake up in the morning, our attention is leaking outward. and It's as if we're stuck on autopilot, going through the same routines, the same pain, anxiety and stresses driving our lives. The same behaviours and conditionings acting out and then seeking relief from those feelings. So it's a wheel and we're stuck on this collective carousel, which is about ready to collapse. So all humans want connection, want love and want to belong. In other words, all human beings have a natural desire to seek wholeness. So the world we have built demands our attention and promises us this wholeness, but it never lives up to its promise, only temporary satisfaction, exactly like a drug. We're all addicted to the world system we've built, totally addicted, and we call that addiction functional, and anything outside of that functionality we call dysfunction. But the problem is that the world we've built is destroying the natural world and ourselves. Just like a drug user being promised relief from the drug, or the addiction destroys his or her life, we're promised wholeness within the system, while at the same time it's destroying us. So the cycle of addiction is happening on a planetary scale. We're all addicted because we're all terrified of facing what would come up if we didn't have this support, this addiction. But as I said, the system's destroying us and all life on earth. And if there are people reading this that are in denial, just think of when someone tells a drug user they're destroying their lives and they stay in denial until its destructive effects come to the point of nearly killing them. So it's the same cycle and the same carousel and it's all addiction. So the more I you know, do this work, it's sort of getting to the root of that sort of loop that we're all in and that loop is addiction. And I think that's what we're born into. It's that craving and aversion that comes up. You know, we're, we, we sort of seek positive. You know, we want it to be always daylight. We seek relief. We seek relief. But what's driving that is a deep wounding underneath it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was born into that wounding and I carried that wounding as, as most of us do. So we can look at the drivers, of, you know, my addiction as actually the driver of, of humanity and all, all our dysfunction. Right, right. Yeah. And when we're born into an environment like that, which is very, very common, um, most of us are very disconnected, not attuned to in a real deep way within yeah. families. So it's really easy for a child to get lost or to just feel like they don't matter. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that then was like... get, Yeah. So what was it that that brought you to the point where you were I mean, obviously, the, there's a fear of feeling alone and disconnected and abandoned. What brought you to the, to the point where you stopped using drugs? I'd lost everything. You know, I'd um, had loved ones die at my feet, overdosed. I'd had um, you know, like very close friends die in the same scenario. Um, lots of my friends were spending years and years in prison. Lots of my friends turned on me. Um, things just got really, really chaotic and I was left alone at the end. So right at the end, it was just me and, and heroin and, and, you know, pharmaceuticals when I could get them because they made Xanax quite hard to get by that point. But, um, and like, I, I remember, like I, I went to rehab and I'd been to rehab 17 times, um, oh, attempted wow. rehab 17 times. Um, mm-hmm. But I just hit this point of like, like I realized that the only thing left that can go is my life. Everything else has been ripped from me. And um, at that point, I intuitively knew that my trauma was what kept driving me back. Because I'd, I'd get clean for you know a week, a couple of days or however long. And then that fight, flight, freeze, that trauma would all kick up. And mm-hmm. I'd be walking to go score, to go use. And I'd be telling myself you know I don't want to do this why am I doing this you know I know what's going to happen I'm going to be caught in that same cycle it's going to do this it's going to yeah. be but my body would still be walking there right. right you know I lost the ability to choose mm-hmm. it was I was being chosen so to speak mm-hmm. um, by this pain 
you know, it was making the decision because you know, the body was so hooked up at that point to seek relief from everything that was going on in there. Right. It only knew one way. To Mind think. and yeah. 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 And um, so that final point, you know, I sort of hit a surrender and like I realized um, it was like a moment of clarity, you know, um, you call it like a mini awakening or something, but it was like a, a moment where I became aware of what had happened. <laughs> The rest mm-hmm. of the time, I'd been so delusional, you know, so in denial. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and you know, from from that point, I decided, well, yeah, I'm I'm going to work on my trauma. I'm going to have to. You know, I've, I've got no other option. And if this doesn't work, I'm just going to go. I, I literally said to myself, I'm just going to go out and use and resign to to overdosing and dying. Like I, I was at that low of a rock bottom. Right. And um, so. Like I went and saw a, a, a trauma therapist, and I tried tr- talk therapy, th- talk therapy for my trauma, and um, like it, it actually re-traumatized me every single time. Uh, um, yeah. You know, so like talking about my trauma, I could feel myself just shutting down, becoming more and more triggered, until the point I'd go to talk therapy that I'd be so shut down, I'd be telling the story, and I'd be just numb and not really feeling anything. Not feeling anything. Yeah, because right. my system knew it was re-traumatizing, so it shut down and just numb. You dissociated, yeah. Yeah, completely dissociated. Right. And um, so I'd done that a lot, but so this time I decided, well, yeah, I'm going to try holistic methods. Um, I didn't know about Scott at, at this point. Um, that came yep. much later. But my um, my trauma therapist actually, without saying it, incorporated all of all of this, all of Scott's stuff. But he'd come to the same conclusions through his own journey so I was quite lucky you know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was lots of somatic work um faster EFT and a few other things and um but what would happen was you know I'd have a, an emotion let go and it was the first time in my life I ever had something let go um uh, you know it was the first time in my whole life you know every everything that had ever happened to me I'd just pushed down yeah and, um, so you felt safe enough with this person that you were able to to I feel did. it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not sure why. Um, I don't just, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, as something would let go, it was sort of like I'd feel my body go back to oh, mm-hmm. calm and safe as, as something would let go, and um, like oh, this this is all I've been seeking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's know? drug free. Yeah, and it, and it was drug free, yeah. and um, so as time went on, you know, with, with working with him, um, like my PTSD, you know, it was up here. It just started to you know, come back down, mm-hmm. and so. But then what happened is I started to go through a bit of an identity crisis, or like a total identity crisis, actually. Um, yeah. Not one where I was breaking down, but it was more like a an identity crisis where I was, I was just spontaneously inquiring and I had no clue about non-duality. Mm-hmm. But so I decided, well, you know, if, if these things can go, then that that's who I thought I was. And so then, then who am I? And um, like a, the whole awakening side of things is becoming less and less relevant to me. It, it doesn't really matter so much. Um mm-hmm. Because as Scott says, it, it doesn't actually resolve much. <laughs> it can right. be very it can be very freeing, but you know, we it just means we we know who we are in the midst of you know our, our traumas. It can be very much acting out in the midst of that. Right. So, um. You know, like I came across Scott because like I realized that there was so much conditioning still playing out. Mm-hmm. Um. And also, I like became very interested in Gabor Mate and all the people that were saying trauma is the driver of addiction. And um, yeah, yeah. Like, like experientially it was so true and observing people in, in 12 step programs in you know, like all the rehabs I've been to, I could see that, you know, this underlying driver was, was this wound of, yeah. of addiction and I'd see people get clean and, you know, still completely have that wound and then be acting at different addictions, you know, mm-hmm. um, whether it was sex addiction, whether it was you know porn, whether it was um, gym 
you know, people get so addicted to the gym in early recovery. Right. Um, you can get addicted but, to health things too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And so I started to see that this wound was actually driving the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And um, so, like, I, I became very interested in that, obviously, as as someone would, you know, like, again, mm-hmm. sort of clarity around, you know, what had driven all the destruction in their life. It's going to become quite interesting. You know, right. And seeing yeah. that it's actually driving so much of the world. Right. Yeah, and I was thinking, I was speaking to Scott not long ago, and we were saying, you know, that the survival of our species actually hangs on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really does, you know, because otherwise it will, you know, drive us right, right into extinction. It already is, you know. Yeah. And uh, so many other creatures and species on Earth. But so obviously, I became quite interested in it, and. You know, after having this, what they call non-dual awakening, um, it was sort of like I could still see that it was driving a lot of what was happening in my life. It was driving mm-hmm. how I would react to my mum when she would say something. You know, it was driving how I would react to my partner um, when, you know, I'd be triggered. So I was still acting out different wounds. You know, even though my PTSD had dropped significantly you know like someone can still be acting from this wound these wounds doesn't have ptsd you know a diagnosis of ptsd so i was still acting from different woundings Mm -hmm. and um you know so i became quite interested in in resolving that because what was happening as well is I, i could dissociate into awareness and deny it as all just as illusion you know, right. that, uh, yeah. you know, which I think so many people in, in the non-dual scene can really do. And looking back, you know, like even though I'd had this non-dual awakening, I was in contact with people who had realised themselves as the presence of awareness. We were all fooling ourselves at the end of the day. We were still totally in denial about certain parts. There were still fragmented parts, or still mm-hmm. fragmented parts of all our psyches that needs need to return to wholeness, need to be integrated. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. um, so I became much more interested in that, you know, because my experience is that like awareness, that stillness, or wh- whatever word we want to call it, presence, is is stable. It's it's always there. I'm always resting as that as as who I am. But a, when a trigger comes up, you know, I don't act from that place. You know, I, I, right. I can very much act from the trigger. I think a lot of teachers as well can really do that and it causes a lot of a lot of damage as well. Mm-hmm. So um as I as I was acting these things out, I realized okay, you know, that there's obviously more work to be done. And um so like I, I don't even know how I discovered Scott. It was sort of like by chance a friend of mine shared one of his one of his links. Um mm-hmm. And I saw he was talking about awakening and, and he was also in recovery. And I think it was the quote on your email, actually, right at the bottom that I first ever read. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, so I, like, I was just compelled to sort of get in contact with him. And, mm-hmm. um, so I sent them a message through Facebook and Jessica replied. And um, they were running a training, like, I think it was a month later. And so, oh. yeah, jump, jump. I was like, yep. I just felt compelled to do it, and um, yeah. So then, like, um, I just continued to do that. Now I'm helping train people, and also um, a senior facilitator, and doing lots of stuff with Scott and Julianne. And, you know, mm-hmm. So what? Um, I the the tools in the Killaby Inquiry method are very powerful. Yeah. What was your experience as you were learning them? Well, um, my experience was. Like I said, I, I like presence was quite stable, you know, and for a, lot, for a lot of people, presence isn't stable, so it, it, it also needs to be practiced. Right. Um, right. You know, I f- was actually working with like my, my other trainees at the start, and there was a bit of a projection that they were just stable in in presence. But the the tool, my experience with working with it for myself was it really started to show me, you know, um, what was still unconsciously driving me. I knew it was this wound, but I wasn't aware of the deep hidden beliefs that were there. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I wasn't aware of, um, I was aware of how to be with um, 
sensations in the body, but I wasn't aware of how to really be with thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I was attempting to bypass the thoughts and come down into the body. I was, um, I had all these. Can you, can you give an example of some of the thoughts yeah. you were working with? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, they, they, they were quite interesting, very shame-based thoughts. Oh. Um, you know, there'd be, there'd be hateful thoughts and then there'd be like shame lurking in the background around hate or I'd experience anger. And there'd be shame, like a cloud of shame in the background, because you know, you know, when we're when we when we're growing up, it's sort of like we do something wrong in the school system or or at home or something, and we're shamed for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. shame's really used as a way to control us. Yeah, um, it, well, it's effective. So, um, that, that, yeah, that. and it's not just the behavior; it's you should yeah. be ashamed of yourself. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's who you are, you know. So I like that sort of shame that was lurking in the background it was sort of inquiry really helped bring that forward mm -hmm. yeah because if I was having hateful or angry thoughts at, at someone you know then the shame wasn't was making me not look at it right yeah to avoid it yeah yeah, yeah it was it was like no I, I don't want that there so bringing that shame to the surface looking at that shame and being with that shame um you know, and then now it's sort of like I can look at those thoughts. They're just, you know, they, they don't really have a charge anymore. You know, so my experience has, has been more and more has just dropped away. But I don't even like saying dropped away. I just say returned, you know, um, returned to wholeness. So those those parts that were fragmented have integrated. And there's still lots more work to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... um. Sorry, so, so the process of, of those parts being integrated. Um, so part of it is shame. When we're feeling shame, we don't really have very good access to ourselves because we shut down, we kind of go away, we disappear. So what were you discovering about yourself as you were working with that? Well, I, I, I discovered that, you know, that there was an underlying undercurrent of shame throughout my whole life. So I was discovering all these different undercurrents that were always there. There was an undercurrent of impending doom. There was an undercurrent of anxiety. There's an undercurrent of, of shame. Shame was a massive, massive one, but I discovered with me, and it's different for everyone, that shame has been really a glue that has held it all together. Um, I, I had a, a very shame, I don't want to say completely based personality, but it was a big baseline there. Um, you know, And I th also think it is for most people too, um, collectively, you know, like walking around, you can see like, you know, billboards with women that have just been completely photoshopped and, you know, right. like it, that that's, everyone's going to feel shame about themselves because they can't live up to. These, can't live up to that. Yeah. Yeah. Can't live up to that. And, um, so I think a lot of people could relate to discovering there's a lot of shame inside. So how is that different for you with awareness? Like you, you know you're not the shame. You know you're not your experiences. And yet it's still very much your experience. How did that work? So it, 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 was, it was interesting because, you know, I know it's not me, but it's still very much there. Nope. So what happened was there was like a, there's awareness and then experience, which to me isn't the end of non-duality because there's still a very, very big duality sitting there. It's sort of like awareness and experience. It's a, it's a duality. And I think lots of non-dual teachings are there to wake us up out of experience. But until those two things come together, you know, I think it's incomplete, um, in, in my opinion. Um, so like my, my experience was I woke up out of experience sort of into like a witnessing aware presence. And as more and more things dissolve, it's like the witness dissolves into, into everything. But which is which is a very interesting experience and I can't even talk about it. You know, it's there's no point talking about when that happens. Um, but it's sort of like I woke up, but then the shame and all that was still being experienced. I was still acting from those places. But then, you know, like I was totally aware that that was happening. But then there was also another part of me that, you know, started to fight against it. Like, what what am I doing? You know, I don't want to be doing this. You know, so then like it, there's different fragments you know but I started to spot these like through inquiry and through awareness and watching what what was happening and then I started to gain acceptance around them 
and when I started to accept them and just see them for what they are, you know, and really come down into the body. Like I can't stress that enough, working with the body because it's all stored within the body. It's sort of like um, throughout our life or throughout my life, I um, left parts of myself um, throughout my life, but they were all imprinted energetically in the body. And that's all, you know, trauma really is. It's an energetic imprint held in the body. And when, um, when triggered, they veil the present moment. You know, they make us act from past conditioning. It's just a, an energetic imprint that gets triggered. So I'd woke up, but all these energetic prints, imprints were still there, playing out, causing suffering you know, to myself and other people. You know, they did dramatically decreased compared to the, like, you know, the, my previous life, <laughs> um, you know, dramatically, but it would, they were still playing out in, in more and more subtle ways. So, um, you know, as I, as I began to, began to inquire, I learned to just be with them in a skillful way and more and more and more as it's becoming more and more natural to just let myself be as I am. You know, and it's sort of like awareness and experience that gap is, is closing. I think they say in Zen, close the gap. Um, and I think this is what they mean, you know, awareness and experience sort of closing together. But, you know, if we continue to de like um, deny all these unspent energies, because that's what they are, you know, we can call it karma, we can call it energetic imprints, we could call it trauma or unspent energies. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. But if we can continue to, to deny these imprints, you know, we, we won't be able to live an embodied awakening we won't be able to live from that place we'll still be doing damage we'll still be playing out the old thing and to me what's the point you know like what what is the point if we're just going to do any if we're going to be acting from the same place and so so to me like this is an evolution that's that's happening right. it's happening to more and more people can you go into a little bit of detail around the the inquiries themselves so if you're working with someone who has a lot of shame or if you wanted to refer back to your own experience, how do the, how do you stay in your body? How do you work with thoughts? Like, can you just explain that a little bit for people? Yeah. So it, it's, it's interesting because the more I do this work, the less I'm following a, a method. <laughs> um, and the more I'm just being there with them and um, like asking certain questions, I might use the tool or I'll use the tools, but it's not really following a method. So it's difficult to say because as I'm working with someone, it's, very intuitive um but to come down into the body say if someone's got extreme ptsd it's sort of like a, you bounce out straight away so um when when i'm when when someone has that issue you know i always work with them in different ways you know, but just a simple technique for anyone watching you know if you've got shame coming up in the body or any any um emotion any negative emotion that we want to turn away from you know, just this very simple practice, you know, that I did a lot of and I did it with shame is when it comes up in the body, just hold your hands on the shame and just stay with it. And just stay with the breath, breathing with it. Because it's so habitual for us to turn away, to go off into thinking or to, to run. But, you know, like just like touching and staying with it. That way we're starting to allow ourselves to just be as we are you know, without any expectation of getting rid of it or wanting it to go away you can just stay with it and this is just a simple practice you know for, for people to do but um, when I'm working with someone sometimes I might do that you know and if there are thoughts coming up we can put them up on a screen and look at them and you know say it's it's the words, you know, I hate myself, which which comes up a lot for people. And we can just look at those words and notice the space around them. Start to see them as just words. And something I used to do was, you know, with shame was a big one with shame as well. Shameful thoughts was bring them right in because I had that urge to turn away from them all. I'd bring them right in. And I'd ask questions, you know, like, can those thoughts hurt me? Um, do some, like, different mining techniques. So what's the worst that could happen if I, if I look at that thought? You know, so start to conjure up those fears and look at them and then bring them right in. 
And then they just sort of completely lose their power, you know, those thoughts, because they're seen. And then coming down into the body and just staying with that sensation, I'm not trying to make it go away, just sort of staying with it, feeling it move. And you know, when you become more skillful, you know, to do this on your own, you can start like dancing with the sensation, sort of like not resisting it. Letting it move as it wants to move, like if it wants to expand. You dance with that, if it wants to contract, you dance with that. Until it moves through on its own. So, you know, like I, I say to people I work with that um like these energies know where to go to really to liberate themselves. It's just we stand in opposition to them. <laughs> No, it's just so. Why, why do we do that? I mean, that's such a common human thing. Why do we do that? Yeah. Uh, like, I can only guess, but I think it has something to do with like deep hidden beliefs around our survival instinct, you know, like through my own inquiry, that's what I've come to. Like, I'll be overwhelmed and stuck like this forever. And then I mine it out deep enough. I'll be die. I'll die if I completely allow this. No, or I'll, yeah, I'll be stuck. That's that's a, that's a big one for a lot of people. So like other other beliefs. So we stand in opposition because things are hidden in our unconscious. No, so, but if we stop standing in opposition, like I say to some people as well, um, depending on where someone's at, you know, if someone's had a lot of experience with inquiry, I won't just be teaching them to come down because some people have never done that, never felt a, a feeling. No, um. So some people will do that, but if someone's had a lot of inquiry, I won't, I won't be doing that. But I say, I say to some people, you know, take the attitude that you're freeing the negative emotion itself. You don't want to be free from negative emotion. That was actually something I got from, from Ajashanti, but I think it's brilliant. Um, Cause if we're trying to be free from negative emotions, we are still standing in opposition to it. But if we're freeing the negative emotion itself, if we're just sort of dancing with it in, in non-resistance to let it be free and then it will free itself by itself you know, but we can want it to go away in such subtle 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 ways you know because it is so deeply ingrained in us yeah so through inquiry well, and of course we want relief from it yeah we do of course. we want relief from our suffering and we know we're not supposed to want it to go away but yeah. We, we, we do want another. to go away. Right? Yeah. yeah. We can set up another yeah. walk. You know, oh, I'm meant to be welcoming this, but I can't. I, I, I just want it to go away. So then we just be with that, that wanting it to go away. You know, we, we don't, because then we can want to get rid of that because we're meant to be, you know, it's like a, a house of mirrors because <laughs> we're meant to be welcoming it, but we want it to go away. You know, it can, it can, and this is what happens if you try to do this with the mind. You know, um, it has to be done from 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 rest, from from presence. So the kinds of things that you've discovered about yourself, um, and the kinds of things we would all discover about ourselves, no matter what, you know, we might discover we're jealous or petty, or we might really feel regret about something we've done, or whatever it is. Um, what's your experience with allowing those to be to be present? Look, um, I think, so you mean like jealousy or regret or just things things from the past? Yeah, just those things that torture us, like, oh, I wish I hadn't yep. done that, or I wish I'd done that. or Yeah, so look, it, it's it's sort of like um, through practice, you know, any anything that we habitually push away, we start to see that they're less and less dangerous. You know, for me, it was sort of like I, I had deep beliefs that it these things will kill me or someone will find out I'm thinking these thoughts. That was, that was a big one. I had like, you know, projecting that people could read my mind. But as I started to see through them, it, it became much more easy to allow them. You know, like, a, like a, I, I remember just sitting there looking at a sensation and just asking, is that sensation actually a threat? You know, can it harm me? And it was like, well, no. And I could feel that with my whole being at that point. And then it was like relaxing with it, you know, so like it was allowed by itself when it was foreseen, when it was seen for what it is. It wasn't something I had to actively do. It was sort of like peeling away the, the layers around it and it was just seeing it for what it is. And then it was, it was totally allowed. But 
if something, you know, I think like um, collectively as well, our survival instincts like a hummingbird in the background. And I think a lot of the time it's not keeping us safe from, you know, immediate threat to our lives. It's keeping us safe from these wounds, from these emotions. You know, it's like we're treading water up here, you know, constantly our survival instinct on hyperdrive, trying not to be swallowed into what's down here. But through inquiry, you know, skillful inquiry, we can actually see that it's actually not a threat and we can drop down. You know, so I think another issue with, with humanity is we're totally disembodied. We're actually lost in past and future, so to speak, lost in thinking, lost in what we're doing, lost in the world, and we're, we're not coming down into our bodies because this is where it's all held. So I think it's... Well, it's pretty scary to come into our collective body if we look at what's going on with the earth. It is, yeah. And uh, the environment. Right. And so how, how do people, or how do you... How do you deal with that? How do you work with that? What's look, happening in the world right now and the despair? And Yeah. So, look, it, it's it's taken a lot of practice um, or a lot of seeing. But, um, you know, I've had lots of collective stuff come through my nervous system. Um, you know, and when it's, when it's really full on, I might go for a walk into the bush and shake, let the body just shake and let it, let it move through. Some of it's heart-wrenching. You know, I, I might just let the body fall down to the floor. You know, but some people, you know, um, would not be able to do that just due to that survival instinct. And there's so much stuff still going in the bo- on in the body. Um, but with, with awareness, if we're doing things from that space of awareness, then it's kind of like um, it's less scary because we know it's not going to consume us. You know, we know ourselves as this as this presence that can't actually be hurt by any of it. So when these really like these deep, these, these deep dark sort of collective energies can start to come through, we can start to be a space for them. You know, to come through instead of become them and like you know you could easily have a psychotic break with the intensity of some of them. Um, but you know, we can start to really be a space for them to move through. Yeah, but it, it's very difficult to explain. I suppose I'd have to film myself doing it <laughs> because, like, I, with with some of the the intensity of, of the energies that have been coming through recently, um, it's sort of like no method. No, there, there's no method. It's just a completely letting it move through. You know, seeing seeing right. it as it happens. Yeah. yeah. So awareness. If someone hasn't had an awakening experience yeah. and they still are pretty um I'm open to the idea that there's that we're that we're more than our thoughts and our experiences but yeah. it hasn't really um taken hold yet so how do you how would you recommend that someone might develop that stability more that perspective more yeah so so look it's um for me i i, I like it happened without any sort of teaching or anything like that but you know I, I guess contemplating the the idea that something in you hasn't changed throughout your whole life it's always been there it's been present throughout all experience it's always present you know, and I'm not a teacher and I, I don't I don't want to be a teacher at all nothing in me wants to teach non-duality or, or this stuff um, but like I, I for the for the purpose of answering your question it's just something is still and aware of experience you know and so just being aware of being aware, you know, and it's almost too simple for the mind, you know, because the mind expects it to be this, you know, big thing or event or, you know, realization. But for me, it was just a very simple recognition. Like, oh, you know, I literally said, oh, <laughs> like that, that was it, you know, it was, and I just became aware of it. It's just, I can sort of act it out better than I can say it. It's just that simple looking simple being aware that that's that's all it is and the deeper we go into that you know like i've i've had um lots and lots of mystical experiences which also come and go you know which can also be mistaken for for awakening you know so just being aware of being aware and we can start to watch thoughts and watch them pass by and then 
and they fall away, we can become aware of the gap between thoughts. Right, something I used to do, you know, was to, like I'd be driving or doing whatever, I'd focus on the gap between the in-breath and the out-breath. Mm -hmm. You know, because there'd be like a still point there. This was after awakening. This was just to stabilize that because I'd be forgetting and all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'd focus on that gap. And all day I was doing this. So I was sort of, my attention had turned completely inward. Right. Mm -hmm. For, for years, a um, couple right. of years actually. Um, it's, I think it's been about two and a, two and a half years maybe since that mm -hmm. one, that it, it took about probably 18 months. But so just focusing on that gap and bringing attention to that to that silence. So you know we don't want to silence the mind because the mind it's like trying to, um, it was Alan Watts said it's like trying to um flatten waves with your hands you know you just stir it up more yeah yeah um so we don't want to silence the mind we want to aware that we want to become aware that underneath the mind is there's already a silence it's like going down below the ocean there's a, mm -hmm. the waves can be waving but there's a stillness that exists below mm -hmm. the ocean. so it's already there and it's already who you are it's it's already there and already who you are. So um, and there's lots of teachers who are amazing at pointing at that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at that at that silence and that awareness. You know, Scott Scott. I'm so sure Scott is amazing at it as well. Right. So when you're working with somebody, you don't um, you don't really do that kind of pointing. It's more working with thoughts, seeing through the thoughts, working with what's in the body, mining for energy. Mm -hmm. Mining for meaning, that kind of thing. It depends what someone wants, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 there, there are clients I see that you know I do do that work with. You mm -hmm. know? Um, like so, we might be looking at a, a, a picture, you know, an image in the mind that's got a you know, strong bodily sensation, and I might just sort of say, well, you know, can you become aware of yourself as what's looking at the picture? Mm -hmm. Can you become aware of yourself as the awareness or can you turn attention back on what it is that's looking? It's like St. Francis of the CC, what you're looking for is what is looking. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. In the most literal sense. <laughs> right. yeah, we're not aware of what's behind our eyes. So. Mm -hmm. And um so we're just looking. And you know, so I might be pointing to that towards someone, but you know, like not not all of my clients, you know, probably a, a, a minority of my clients are interested in awakening. They're just in so much pain, you know, and like I would never sit there and say, well, you, you need to wake up or anything like that. that that's not what they need. Um, and that's not what they're asking for. It's not what they're there for. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when we have so much compulsion in the mind and catastrophic thinking and hypervigilance and all of that going on in our nervous system, it's very difficult to be aware of silence or stillness or something like that. So I think we do have to work directly with some of those things. That's right. And also, you know, it can actually be um, quite, quite damaging, you know, the non-dual teachings to someone who suffers a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. it can It can cause a whole lot of bypassing, you know, um, right can start to really it, it can i've seen it you know where the the self structure turns into like a kind of twisted self-denial you know like i don't exist you know and sort of gets like a superiority complex to sort of overcompensate for that for that pain that's that's in the system and it'd be yeah, it can actually be quite damaging i've, I've seen it happen how long is it that you have not been using drugs since you you've been clean three and a half three and a half years yeah yeah, yeah so what's, li what's life like for you right now i've got a, a family um i've got a, a 15 month old son one year old son um you know my partner she, she's she's amazing um she's right into her own healing and all, all of that sort of stuff in her own way um, completely her own way um i get along with my parents i um work one-on-one -on -one with people from all over the world do, doing this work. Um, 
like the mind is just getting more and more quiet. You know, I, I remember like a, after having this awakening and whatnot, like I wanted to teach, I wanted to, you know, be involved in the non-dual. That's all gone. You know, um, like a, even when I, when I became certified in Scott's course, like I wanted to be, be a senior and then I became a senior. I didn't ask, they asked me to, but and then a trainer. And it was sort of like I wanted, there was still this wanting to build, but that all of that sort of dropping away and things are becoming more and more quiet and I'm just becoming more and more, um, we can say present, but just here, you know? Yeah. The process of, of healing from trauma, do you feel like it mostly takes people a few years? Is that something that... Like I use a few different modalities, you know, KI being the main one. Um, but like there's a certain, a specific traumatic event, you know, it, it can be, be resolved quite quickly, the emotional charge behind that one event. But, you know, when we're talking about, about trauma, it can take a lot. Like the way I use the word trauma, you know, and I use it like a, a collective trauma, ancestral trauma, generational trauma, all, all of that, you know. Um, it can take a long, long time. <laughs> it can. That's true. It takes a long time to build up, and we have to heal the nervous system as well. And That's right. Yeah, yeah. And the more we we um resolve stuff in our body, the more um effortlessly present we become. You know, for a lot mm -hmm. of people, being present must uh, starts off as like a task. We have to try. You know, mm -hmm takes effort <laughs> yeah. it really does yeah. to sort of reverse that conditioning but um you know the the more we resolve the stuff in our system the more um effortlessly present we become i'm working a lot with the heart at the moment um mm -hmm. you know it's it's sort of like the, the mind can just drop into that heart space you know just spontaneously throughout the day Mm -hmm. like I, can't, I can't describe the experience, but um, like I think if if this is also something I just I said that it's um something I totally agree with. If if human beings collectively need anything, it's to drop the head into the heart. Yes, mm -hmm. it's what we all need, you know. So when when I'm working with someone, like I just like I said, all methods sort of falling away at this point you know like following a formula or anything and it's becoming more like a flow but I just sit there with you know with my hand on my heart and just stay in there and I can feel that it's doing the work mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah and I can do that with myself also if I've got stuff going. right yeah. that's quite a difference from where you were several years ago it is yeah yeah do you feel like you're still, um, do you still have a lot of physical trauma from the years of taking drugs? Yeah, I, I get a, a bit, a fair bit of chronic, chronic pain. You know, I've started eating only organic um, water that's not out of the tap because I can feel that's mm -hmm. what my body wants. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, over the past, like I'm not abstinent. I, um, you know, I um, <laughs> like might have a glass of wine every now and then. Um, <clears throat> and but I can feel my body, it will just give me that, that somatic no that Scott talks mm -hmm. about. You know, um, right. When it doesn't want something. It, it, it even start, it does it with foods. <laughs> you know, different mm -hmm. foods. It's like the body's intelligence you know, is starting right. to guide itself what it needs to heal. And I just become, I just listen to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that and just comes through. There gets to be enough quiet that you can hear it. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So put, putting a, awakening aside, you know, um, you know th this work can really be for, for everyone, you know, because like the, we're, we're so conditioned to abandon parts of ourselves, you know, to toss them out, like into the depths of our unconscious, push them down. You know, yeah. But like I've been saying that like the, these are the drivers that are driving us. That's why, why we replay the same relationships, the same patterns, the same hurt, the same jobs, the same this, the same that. You know, right. But if we can bring those up and be with them in, in a skillful way, you know, um, it can be very, very helpful with someone holding space. You know, because I've seen people try this stuff by themselves without you know, holding space um, and then you know, send me an email and say, I'm getting so caught up. You know, it's making it right. I'm getting more and more distressed. You know, so um, that's why I say to people just with that, 
if you if you're on your own. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's good simple advice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it works. You know? Yeah, it works. Yeah. yeah, somehow we have to become friends with ourselves and connect with our own heart and allow our feelings and feel the feelings and that's can, that can be a scary big thing, especially at the beginning. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, it can be very helpful to have someone holding space mm -hmm. to work with this stuff. And me and Julianne run trainings. So, you know, like um, some people do the trainings just for their own deepening so they can learn to do it themselves. They don't actually want to work with clients or have a business doing that. Um, mm -hmm. They just want to do it for themselves. Um, okay. Then also we were, we're running a do-it-yourself course in February. We'll be running more of those as well, where we just teach people how to do this on themselves. Um, so there'll be lots of little courses and deepening courses and all of that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. So how do people get a hold of you? Um, I've got a website with a booking system, actually, to make it easier because it's got a time zone converter and all of that. I was right. getting you know, so confused trying to work out the time yeah. differences. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's www.mattnedleton.com, so M-A-T-T-N-E-T-T-L-E-T-O-N.com. And okay. um, there's heaps of videos, heaps of blog posts, um, heaps of that stuff on my website. Um, mm -hmm. I, I write lots, lots of blogs. Um, and there's a booking system. So you can book in a free half an hour consult. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just to chat and, you know, for me to give context around around this work, around what I do, um, and also, you know, what, what you're coming to me for and if this is right for you. Because, you know, I never go one size, shoe fits all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, someone's got to intuitively feel that it is right for them or, and that, or that I'm the right facilitator for them. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's it's – a, it's a good thing to be conscious of that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, because they've got to feel safe. Well, thank you, Matt, and um, and I'll put all the website information that up there, and people can have a look. And you're on Facebook as well. Yeah, I am. It's Facebook.com/slash Matt Nettleton three yeah, three. Okay. Great. Good. All right. Well, thank you, and all the best for the future. Thank you. All right. Bye for now. Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center Radical Recovery Summit. We are so excited to bring you the lineup for January 10th to 19th, 2020. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to see the new headliners for 2020 and to sign up. You can watch free January 10th to 19th or buy an all-access pass.